Hello and welcome. I'm Amritan Shirai and you're watching Law of the Land on Raj Sabha TV. Today we bring to you the Companies Amendment Bill 2016. To discuss the issue, I have with me Mr. Anshul Jain, partner, Luthra and Luthra, and Mr. Mayank Mishra, partner, J. Sagar Associates. Now for the headlines. Bill makes provisions to exempt foreign companies from compliance. Forward dealing and insider trading will no longer apply. Independent directors allowed to have transactions with their companies. The Companies Amendment Bill 2016 allows for exempting class of foreign companies from registering and compliances regime under the existing law. As of now, all companies who are covered under the definition of a foreign company have to comply with regulations of companies law. The amendments in the bill also address several issues faced by the stakeholders at various levels in a company. In order to improve the ranking of India in the Ease of Doing Business Index, so that it becomes an attractive destination for investment, the government proposes to make sweeping changes to the existing company's bill. The proposed changes are broadly aimed at addressing difficulties in implementation due to tough compliance requirements. The bill also seeks to harmonize accounting standards, the SEBI law and the RBI law. I think that was necessary because the 2013 Act actually uh, in, in, enlarged uh, very significantly and probably without any intention uh, compliance requirements for a vast range of companies including pub private companies, smaller companies uh, and the compliance requirements became very, very extreme. Uh, and as you are aware that a committee was set up by the government uh, to look at the Companies Act which recommended fairly extensive redoing of the Companies Act rather than just piecemeal changes in one or two sections. And it's following the recommendations of the committee that this bill has been introduced. So largely the bill has been introduced to actually do away with a lot of things that had got introduced in 2013 Act. So we are looking at a situation where we are rectifying, uh, uh, to my mind, a wrong and not creating more liberties. We are just giving the liberties that always needed to be uh, left there. That was the intention of the law. The Companies Amendment Bill 2016 amends the Act to simplify the private placement process by discontinuing with the separate offer letter, by making filing of details or records of applicants a part of return of allotment. This is likely to reduce the number of filings to the registrar. The bill allows unrestricted object clause in the memorandum of association having detailed listing of objects by self-declaration in place of affidavits. Provisions concerning forward dealing and insider trading will be excluded from the Act. Foreign companies will now be exempted from registering and compliance regime, which was earlier required under the Act. What the bill now does is that it allows for a provision where a foreign company can seek a dispensation from the registration requirements on the basis that certain categories of restrictions should not be applicable or because of the nature of activities that it undertakes. Uh, remember that this is all also on the back of one significant change that came about in the Companies Act 2013, which is that even companies which were trading in India through electronic means were captured as foreign companies having businesses in India, which is in itself a very wide impact. And therefore, having a provision for dispensation which is subject to approval from the relevant ROC, uh, again, uh, makes uh, perfect sense. And I think practically various companies would look to, look to seek dispensation. Companies Law Committee had submitted a report to the Union Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Arun Jaitley, on the Companies Act. The report suggested by the Companies Law Committee had various recommendations which have been incorporated in the Companies Amendment Bill 2016. The Companies Bill 2016 was introduced in Lok Sabha on March 16, 2016 to amend the Companies Act 2013. To curb the incidence of frauds and scams in the large corporates, government has come up with the Companies Amendment Bill 2016. 
The amendment bill seeks to provide an efficient and clear enforcement process rather than burdening the large corporates with excessive legislations. With cameraman Naveen Kumar, Dipali Pandit for Rajya Sabha Television. I hope to underline this fact that, uh, that there are several documentations and compliance activity which the foreign companies have to do as of now and to promote ease of business. This is what the Government of India proposes in its 2016 bill. By the way, it has been passed by the Lok Sabha. Yes. So I'll get uh, Anshul in uh, right on this. What's the best that the government can do in a situation like this? I understand that this is going to be part of rules and uh, rules that are going to be framed later. But what's the best that the foreign companies can expect? Because the statements of object, objects and reason in the bill clearly states that this is one of the objects that the government is looking at. Yeah. Uh, so yes, you are correct that uh, the, com the ministry is focusing to provide as much ease of doing business to foreign companies as possible. Uh, but the devil lies in details. Uh, the that's, where, that's where I want your input. Devil lies in the details. So correct. what is the best you can expect? So uh, what we are expecting from the ministry is that uh, they should provide, uh, as they've already provided, uh, ease and uh, flexibility to hold their general meetings outside India for wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign companies. Uh, we are also, uh, they have also allowed us to consolidate as per their uh, respective uh, accounting standards of their respective countries. We are expecting the ministry to also ease up uh, the disclosure requirement the requirement that uh, the documents that needs to be filed with the ROC in terms of registering a foreign company needs to be lessened. The whole legalization process that needs to be uh, completed in terms of incorporating a company, a, foreign, uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign company needs to be shortened. Uh, what we are also expecting is that in, the, in terms of number of disclosures that they are allowed, that they are as of now required uh, to put forth in their balance sheet and the documents should be shortened as much as possible. And most of these foreign companies are actually uh, uh, privy to the online method. So instead of documenting in a physical format, uh, they should be allowed to document in an online format. Mm -hmm. That is what probably we are looking forward. You want to add to that, uh, man? I think that that captures pretty much and, and as he said rightly, you see, it, it actually depends on what kind of rules and regulations the government ultimately puts up mm -hmm. and, and what kind of provisioning it makes for foreign companies to optionally opt for exemption or like seeking uh, an exemption of a particular part of the act etc etc mm -hmm. and, and devil lies in the details so, so very frankly what what more it can do is really depends on as in how much we want to go there and I also how will it impact the ease of doing business if let's suppose what um, Anshul has pointed out yeah. if the government which I'm not too sure that all of it is going to be met but if at all we meet 50 percent if the government meets 50 percent uh, on the uh, required then how do you see the ease of business thing panning out I, I, I certainly believe this is a step towards making it, making things easier and simpler for foreign companies. For mm -hmm. foreign companies, mm -hmm. but having said that, it is also a bit of a trial and error process. Government will allow for certain things at the beginning, see how it pans out, how how the stakeholders on the private side take it, then again tweak its rules and regulations, and that's why there's a huge amount of delegated legislation. In fact, as far as this part is concerned, which has been delegated and, and left to the government to make rules change, amend, etc. Yeah, and just to add to that, yeah. uh, uh, I've been dealing with uh, many foreign clients in my, uh, 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 in my area of practice and uh, with all these rules, even if 50% of these demands are met, uh, India would be brought up to a pedestal of various, various countries, let's say in European Union or in US. Uh, the legislation of India as of now, the way it is considered is it's draconian. It requires a whole lot of disclosures. Yes. It requires a lot of paperwork, a lot of compliances. That will be easened a lot. And most of these foreign companies will welcome this, will welcome this initiative. And they will try and then look forward for lesser compliances and higher focus on their business operations in the country. Okay, now uh, the foreign companies, as, as I understand, have to make, as of now, just to give an insight to our viewers, as to the documents that these guys, I mean the foreign companies have to comply with, that they have to give it. If you can list out uh, some of them, so that people understand the kind of compliances that they have to undergo right now. 
So in terms of uh, whenever you go ahead for a registration, you have to, a foreign company has to get all their charter documents, all their list of directors, shareholders, uh, properly legalized in their home country and then submit with the ROC. Uh, uh, whenever there is a change, uh, let's say even a director has changed or even a director's disclosure has changed, a director became a director in some other company and uh, he resigned from that other company, that also needs to be disclosed to the Indian regulator, which is, uh, I don't know why is it relevant. Uh, even an email change or a mobile number change or a telephone number change, etc., has to be intimated to the regulator. I mean, quite uh, uh, re ridiculous, I must say. Uh, in terms of, there are various corporate uh, entities across the country, across the globe, uh, who do not follow a set pattern of the shareholding pattern or the directorship pattern or the governance pattern that India follows. Uh, the Indian regulator, unfortunately, is still not privy to such kind of structures, and that is why whenever they seek documentation from such organisations, they do seek uh, documents as per their expectations instead of understanding what the foreign uh, company is planning to uh, or is trying to uh, submit to them. Manka, uh Ease of doing business vis-a-vis yes. -vis the security and protectionist measures that the government needs to look at. Where do you think are the if I mean there's it's all right to say that ease of business and allow everything to come in and uh, make everything easy and do things like that. But what are the protectionist and the security aspects that the government will be concerned with? See, one of the things is uh, the ultimate beneficial holding of, as in, in particular shares, and because you have layering of funds and several companies. So, I believe as far as that part of the act is concerned, it will continue to remain a bit stringent, mm -hmm. and the government is not not too inclined to relax or give a leeway there too much. In fact, this amendment bill itself itself provides for a declaration. Yeah, we'll cover for, it in the next. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so. That, that, that is one of the areas which I will see the, gov the government will always be looking at to preserve and protect as, as, as to know who is investing through whom. Okay. Coming up, the company bill allows the independent directors to have transactions with their companies. Welcome back. The company's amendment bill 2016 allows independent directors to have transactions with their companies up to a certain limit prescribed by the board. The bill also empowers the government to appoint an inspector for determining true persons who have significant beneficial ownership of the company. It also provides for maintenance of a record of significant owners in a company along with filing of returns in this context to the registrar of companies. The Companies Act 2013 was enacted to consolidate and amend the laws relating to companies. The process for establishment of the National Company Law Tribunal and National Company Law Appellate Tribunal is at its final stage. After the constitution of these tribunals, most of the remaining 186 sections of the Act will also be brought into force. There is there's clearly a very wide range of changes which has been brought about. Uh, the changes are purely administrative in some cases, purely practical, uh, purely drafting, but also uh, very, very philosophical in terms of whether or not certain specific categories of restrictions should be applicable to private or unlisted public companies. Uh, so we can talk more in detail about those specific matters, but I think it, it is a very wide encompassing change, uh, which in, in I, I think except for one or two areas where we can always pick out whether or not the drafting could have been clearer, I think it's a very welcome change. The amendments in the bill proposes that companies will now be able to give loan to smaller companies in which the director of the company are interested by passing a special resolution and sticking to disclosure requirement. Restrictions on layers of subsidiaries and investment companies have been removed in the bill. The amendment in the bill would enable companies to align audit committee and nomination and remuneration committee with that of independent directors. The bill enables approval through special resolution by shareholders for remuneration above prescribed limits. As I said, the bill proposes relaxation uh, in procedural formalities which will definitely, in my view, facilitate corporates to ease on their day-to-day -day business. Uh, for example, the uh, reporting time in uh, certain, you know, in, in with respect to certain matters, and the place of AGM, 
So these are some of the issues that will be dealt with in the bill and uh, there are proposals to ease the norms for these. Uh, secondly, I believe that there are prohibitions which in, in the existing uh, legislation which do restrict uh, corporates in their day-to-day -day business. For example, um, uh, loan to directors and the entities that they are interested in. Uh, it's, it's, it includes a lot of entities and therefore there is a lot of restriction on the companies to give out loans. The bill proposes to do away with many of these entities and restrictions. Provisions relating to corporate social responsibility are amended in the bill. These amendments would bring much more clarity in the area. Requirement for annual ratification of appointment or continuance of auditors have also been removed in the bill. The bill provides with the eligibility criteria for constituting corporate social responsibility committees along with the expenditure towards corporate social responsibility, which will be calculated based on the immediately preceding financial year. The bill also provides for punishment in cases of frauds. With cameraman Naveen Kumar, Dipali Pandit for Rajya Sabha Television. Independent directors are allowed to have transactions with their companies. Does it allow or legitimize self-dealing merchants as independent directors? That's the question I would like to ask you, Maimon. No, certainly not. I think it's not, not, it's not to encourage self-dealing. And one of the hallmarks of this particular bill is that they have introduced materiality provisions to, to consider who is independent and who is not and to allow independent directors in that sense to deal at a, at a de minimis level mm -hmm. with some minimal dealing. Yeah. And that I think is a very, very practical step which, which should have been, which ought to have been there I believe. Since, okay, since so how do you think the material uh, uh, benefits will be decoded or de-jargonized or understood? I mean, there has to be a way how do you think that will work? You see, the idea of having independent business as an independent directors was to have non-promoter uh, directors on the board. It was not intended to have, have somebody who is completely insulated in all circumstances from the company otherwise mm -hmm. or, or, or its promoters. So, so bringing in a materiality provision I think I think is 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 a very very positive step and and what would be and there are certain of course the government still can prescribe as to what would be material etc so I want to understand so let's suppose if I am an independent director yes and if I uh, want more than 10% uh, transaction between me and my company and if the board allows me to have that because it's just a board resolution that is required in this case so how will I be rated on the independence index no, again in, as an independence will not necessarily be compromised just because you have had some de minimis or 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 an immaterial if i can use that f a phrase dealing with the company again it, it's a very very subjective thing as in it depends on the what kind of a board resolution and you can see through things no, but we are in law making and that's where you need to spell it out so you can't have a subjective thing entering into an objective law-making activity and that's where I want to understand how does it pan out? I think, I think that's again, it's a positive <coughs> thing if you ask me and it's going to and how it actually is taken by the stakeholders is a bit of a trial and error which, which the government will see and maybe uh, make it more stringent, loosen it further. Does it allow corporate lawyers to become independent directors? Uh, corporate lawyers have been directors on boards of the company. Correct. Case. So yes, it, it that's where the I mean, but so again, there is a benefit that could accrue to all the corporate lawyers. Not necessarily. I wouldn't say that. You, 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 you don't have a corporate lawyer on the board of your company because he's a corporate lawyer. Because maybe he brings some value to the, to the board, the decision-making processes as an at the board level. So it is a subjective decision in that sense. And I don't think that is to facilitate a corporate lawyer or a sister concern sitting in but there. But then why call it an independent director? I'll, I'll bring you in, Anshu. Yeah. Why do you call it an independent director? When you are allowing me to transact business with, your, uh, with my company in which I am an independent director and the board allows me, let's say as of now it's 10% or whatever. So if tomorrow I need to engage more or if the company wants me to do certain things or agree with a whole lot of things on the board, so they hike up hike up my thing to 20% or 25%, okay? So why use the word independent director then? 
So before answering your specific question, I'll just take a step back and I'll try and bring this into perspective. Correct, correct. Uh, under the old Companies Act, Companies Act 56, uh, MCA or Companies Act never dealt with listed companies or independent directors. This was always the domain area of SEBI through Clause 49 of the Listing Agreement, which has now been rechristened as SEBI LODR regulations. So SEBI is the watchdog which deals with independent directors or listed companies. The whole idea or the whole concept of independent directors actually apply on listed companies. And, minist and Com Companies Act, unfortunately, I mean, how hard it tries, unfortunately has to strike a balance between listed companies and unlisted companies. So it cannot formulate a regulation which applies squarely to all and that is where SEBI pitches in. Oh. Now, what Ministry of Corporate Affairs has been trying to do with this uh, bill is that they're trying to strike a balance with what is already there in LODR and what is not there in Ministry of, in, in the Companies Act. And that is how companies were finding it difficult to strike a balance between complying with both the regulations. Coming to your specific question on your independent directors. Independent directors, yes, you're correct. That has to exercise independence in his judgment, in his decision making, in, its, uh, in his involvement into the company. Uh, in terms of materiality threshold, unfortunately, this materiality threshold was not there under the Companies Act and that is why it's proposed to be brought in through the bill, but it was already there in the LODR. So companies have been, independent directors have been working through this materiality threshold uh, in past also. Just to give you an example, an independent director of, let's say, a, a, a air conditioning manufacturing company, if wants to buy an AC from the market of that particular company make, does he compromise his independence just by buying a product or yeah. an independent director of a, a real estate company if buy, wants to buy a flat or a villa from a real estate uh, from the real estate company does he in compromise his independence answer is no mm -hmm. and that is why this whole concept of materiality threshold has been brought in now the question that you raised to uh, my uncle also in terms of uh, uh, whether corporate lawyers are uh, independent directors answer is yes corporate law this this question has already been dealt with uh, dealt by department of corporate affairs in office of place, place of of profit regulations way back in 1970s that a corporate lawyer not only brings value to the table uh, as an independent director but also has an inherent value as a lawyer so if he or she is also involved in a litigation then he or she sh and is getting remunerated because of that he or she will not be considered to have an office or place of profit in the company uh -huh. the same concept applies in the same in section 149 as well uh -huh. that if a listed company hires let's say a managing partner of a firm and he the company also engages the firm per se to do the work of that particular company, there is a clear difference in section 149 related to that. Correct. Moving on, my colleague Depali Pandit spoke to Radhika Shankaran and tried to get her point of view. Do you think the bill will ease up consolidation of accounts process? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, earlier, this basically has got impacted because the definition of the term uh, holding company and subsidiary company and associate company, that has got changed. Earlier, uh, these uh, uh, relations used to be deciphered on the basis of the shareholding and as a result of which even the preferential shareholding uh, was taken into consideration. But now, uh, the uh, relationship is going to be deciphered only on the basis of the voting uh, rights. So as a result, uh, it is, it, you know, a lot many companies uh, would be uh, outside the ambit of the requirement of consolidation of uh, accounts. As far as incorporation of a company is concerned, what all changes have been proposed in the bill and what would be their impact? See, incorporation, as I have already uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the process has not got changed. Only the timelines have got, uh, have got tweaked. You know, in fact, it has been reduced to ensure that the applicants are, uh, are uh, you know, they are also swift as far as uh, approaching the ROC and carrying out the incorporation process is concerned. There is as such no change in the incorporation process. But uh, whatever points I had mentioned in relation to name reservation, the requirement of preparation of memorandum that need not be detailed. So, and also the requirement of setting up of register office, all these things uh, have got, uh, you know, liberalized, I would say. Thank you, sir, for joining us on this discussion. It's time for us to end the show. You can email your suggestions and comments to law.rstv at gmail.com. You can also watch our shows on the RSTV page of YouTube. We'll be back with a new issue and a new episode. Keep watching Raj Sabha TV.